Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday to you. And uh, it's going to be another warm day outside. And I stepped outside today and I said it's warming up nicely. And uh, it's a good day to be indoors. But uh, uh, in any case, I just want to welcome you back to our Bible study here on Facebook Live. And uh, we're back at the 10 o'clock hour. So if you know someone that uh, missed it earlier, send them a text message or message them and tell them, to get on board or throw a, throw a watch party, whatever the case. And uh, we're going to be in our Bibles today in Philippians chapter 2 for a little while. And so if you want to uh, get turned over there, I want to just take a few minutes and share some things with you. Uh, of course, as you know, we um, had a virtual vacation Bible school last week, and uh, it was uh, a blessing to hear from families that the children were learning verses and and going on morning and evening and watching the uh, broadcasts on our YouTube channel. And uh, real blessing it was to hear from uh, a dear family uh, out in Surprise who had a child that on Sunday morning, after hearing the gospel all week, uh, decided that she wanted to accept Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. And uh, so that was uh, kind of uh, the, the thing that just made it all worthwhile to us. We've been praying that someone might trust Christ as their Savior as a result of all of this. It's been kind of a difficult season of time because uh, we've been accustomed to sitting down face-to-face -face with folks and dealing with them about their salvation and, and having the joy of actually uh, seeing people receive the Lord as Savior. And sometimes when you're doing everything remotely, uh, you're just trusting that the Lord is going to honor his word and that it will not return into itself void uh, but what a blessing to hear uh, the testimony of this one who's received the Lord and uh, I, uh, I also want to say that we continue to be in prayer for our church family um, uh, Saturday this Saturday the 8th we have a memorial service for Esther Rosenberger here at the church and that'll be at 11 a.m. and so uh, if you would be in prayer for that, pray for her family as well. And uh, we're still working at confirming a date for Pat Chapman's memorial service. And uh, we'll be passing that information <clears throat> along to you as soon as we have it. And uh, we trust that before day's end, we can be able to bring you an announcement about that. And then yesterday we learned that uh, another dear lady is a part of our fellowship, Cheryl Dix, uh, is, is uh, battling the coronavirus in the hospital and hasn't been doing very well. And, and uh, her husband, David, has been more uh, able to attend the services uh, because he retired uh, from his job at the airport, but his wife has been working almost every Sunday and uh, up until uh, this time of her illness. And uh, that's uh, Nancy's sister-in-law. And so be in prayer for Cheryl, if you would, that the Lord would touch her and raise her up to strength again. And all those in our church family that are struggling with uh, different issues physically, um, and many are dealing with other things in their lives through these days as well. And so uh, thank you for keeping us lifted up to the Lord in prayer. Uh, these are not easy days for ministry, and uh, we're almost continuously uh, dealing with someone who is either uh, dealing with the loss of a loved one or um, someone's being drawn to death and we're trying to just entreat the Lord in their behalf. And so uh, we, we need the prayers of God's people. And uh, I, want to know, I want you to know how much I love you and I appreciate you and how grateful I am to be able to serve the Lord here at Freeway Baptist Church. And uh, what a a joy it was yesterday. We had a good number of folks that assembled for the drive-in service at 8.30, and then we had um, a really good turnout for the second service as well. Um, normally, the 11.30 service isn't the uh, highest attended service, but there was a sweet spirit there, and uh, I'm just thankful that we're able to do this. And uh, yesterday, we had our first um, day where that we streamed on YouTube, on Facebook, and Sermon Audio at the same time. And so I believe that we more than doubled our viewership 
uh, by doing that, and we're thankful that we uh, had that opportunity, and we want you to pass the word along, and uh, that way as well, the, the services uh, will be archived on Sermon Audio as well as on Facebook, and, uh, and so uh, that way you can go back and you can see the song service, the special music, and all of that as well, because it, it tends to archive everything from the beginning all the way to the ending. We're in Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse number 12. But before we do that, I want us to just look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning just eminently aware of our need of thee. Lord, we know that you said in your word in John 15, for without me, ye can do nothing. Lord, we're very aware of that, that nothing of substance or consequence can take place in our lives apart from you. But Lord, we also claim your promise that I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And so Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us for whatever it is that you have appointed for us in this coming week. Lord, help us to be your witnesses. Lord, be with your church family. And God, I pray that you would comfort those that are of a heavy heart and give us wisdom as we seek to do your work in these difficult days. For this we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. This morning we are in Philippians chapter number 2, and there's a great deal uh, that can be uh, said about this chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible for many reasons. Uh, I, I tend to find a great deal of comfort from the book of Philippians. Its theme is joy, and it's a no small thing that it was written from a prison cell. And, uh, and yet, uh, there's some great practical truth, some deep doctrinal truth that we discover herein. And I want to share some of these things with you this morning. And I'll begin reading in verse number 12 of Philippians chapter 2. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. As we begin this uh, study this morning, I believe that it is absolutely imperative for us to understand that Paul is writing from a prison cell uh, to many who uh, are suffering uh, tribulation and persecution because they have placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Paul loves them and he, he greets them as uh, those that he loves. He says, wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed. Now, I want us to just pause there for a minute and consider the fact that uh, Paul is commending them for the fact that as much as he knows and understands, uh, they have always uh, obeyed that which God has delivered for them to do. And, and they had been faithful to carry out uh, the biblical faith and to continue ministry and to have a heavenly value system. And so uh, Paul is saying, ye have always obeyed. And I don't know what you think about that, but man, wouldn't that be wonderful to have said about us? You have just always obeyed. You have always done what God wanted you to do. Listen, I wonder if really that could be said of any of us. Now, understand that whatever God calls us to do and by his spirit he leads us to do, um, if we choose to do something else, yes, we are no longer under the law, but we're under grace. We're at liberty, and we understand these things. 
But if the Holy Spirit of God is leading us in a direction and we choose not to go that way, have we obeyed? I think not. I wonder how many times we have uh, just decided, I'm not going to watch the service, I'll watch it another time, then we never watch it. And the Holy Spirit probably has convicted your heart about that and said, you know, you probably should put the things of the Lord ahead of what you've got planned. Um, one of the things that I'm very concerned about through these days is the fact that um, there are many who have just walked away from the things of the Lord almost altogether. And uh, they are getting uh, their church, if you would, from YouTube and from every, everywhere else except from their own church family. There's no sense of loyalty or devotion to the body where God has placed them. And uh, it's troubling to see that because uh, people want to just do their own thing naturally in the flesh. But when we understand the purposes of God, his plan for this dispensation is to work through the agency of the local church. Now, there's a greater body of believers that comprise, comprises the true church. That is what some people often will refer to as the universal church. It's, it's all those true believers in Jesus Christ. But understand that the universal church uh, has uh, not been structured for the carrying out, per se, of the Great Commission in this dispensation. That which God has chosen to use is churches local that are representative bodies of that greater body called the church. And they don't constitute the sum of the body of Christ, but they are representative of the body of Christ. And see, uh, churches have been organized so that they can be mobilized to strategically carry out the Great Commission. And that is something that God has ordained because that was the mission that he gave to us before he ascended up into heaven to all true believers in Jesus. But he organized it uh, through the churches, local, and he placed pastors uh, in churches to provide leadership. He organized a, a, a deaconship so that deacons could support uh, the, the work of the, the preaching and the communicating of the gospel and the nurturing of the saints. And uh, so those are some things that God has raised up. In the, in the early church period, of course, there were apostles, and, and uh, we, we understand that. There are no apostles alive on the earth today, and uh, regardless of what some people may think, because in order to have been an apostle, you had to have um, met face-to-face -face in physical, in, in physical meeting with the living Lord. And so uh, there's nobody here alive today that can say that, although there are a lot of people that want to lay claim to having had some sort of a vision, but that was not a physical meeting with the Lord. And that was just one of uh, the things that was necessary for someone to be considered as an apostle. But uh, what we find is that God has organized local churches, and there are many that have just disobeyed God's plan uh, because God's plan is churches local. Now, there are a lot of people that say, well, you know, I can take it or I can leave it. Okay, so do you think you're smarter than God? Because this is God's plan. It's not man's plan. It's not something that a bunch of preachers made up to give themselves work to do and to create a following. Uh, the whole concept of the local church is something that was conceived of by God himself and implemented by the apostles who were the pillars of the early church. And uh, the church is a pillar and ground uh, of the truth. And it's called the body of Christ. It's called the building of God. It's called uh, the uh, bride of Christ. And uh, understand this, that if I th ever get to thinking I don't need that. I have set myself at variance with what God has said. Now, you say, well, I don't like 
uh, you know, how the church is functioning. I don't like this or that. And I often say this, people will tell me, well, I, I'm not into organized religion. And I always ask them, are you into disorganized religion? Uh, listen, God is a God of order. He has structured the church. And I understand what most people are saying, that they don't like institutionalized, um, denominational church, the politicized church, the cliquish church. Yet, yeah, I don't know anybody that really likes that. I'm a pastor and I don't like that either. But I love the church because that's what God loves. The Bible declares to us in, in the book of Acts in chapter number 20 something that we cannot overlook. And that is that he's, it, the Bible says here in uh, Acts 20, 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. How important is the church to Jesus? Well, he purchased it with his blood. So do you want to stand up and say, you don't need it? It's not important in your life? You can. You got a Bible in the Holy Spirit? You don't need the church? Listen, um, as much as you may not like some of the aspects of what mankind has done to uh, kind of deviate from what God has ordained for the church to be, realize this, God doesn't have another plan and he didn't appoint you to draft one. The reason why God doesn't have a plan B for the Great Commission is because plan A is perfect. The problem is not with God's plan. The problem is with God's people who refuse to obey. And Listen, I realize that there are many right now because of this global pandemic that are choosing not to gather and assemble uh, personally, publicly because of the fact that they have underlying health issues. And I, and I love those people and I understand those people and I, there's no shame in that. Um, we're, we're behind you 100%. We want you to be absolutely safe. But please understand that doesn't preclude some people from coming down here in their car and participating in a drive-in service, um, there's far less danger of you uh, being exposed to anything adverse in a drive-in service uh, than if you go to the grocery store. And yet, I don't know a lot of people that have just given up on eating through COVID-19, um, but you know they've given up on going to church, um, and many have given up on even watching it online. And the fact is that. Uh, when this all started, we saw this great surge of viewership and, and an increase. And then it gradually began to taper off as we got into this thing a few months. And as much as people were concerned about the loss of civil rights uh, that are guaranteed uh, to us under the First Amendment, um, you know what's more important than our, our rights under the Constitution? Hebrews 10.25, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. So God's call is for us to assemble. And by the way, the word church fundamentally, if we want to just boil it all down, means assembly, a called out assembly, uh, you know, of believers for a specific purpose. And, 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 and that's really a very basic definition of what the church is. So listen, in order for us to be counted among the number of those that always obey, we've got to have the right perspective on what the church is and what our responsibility is to that church. Because we can like it or we can dislike it. It doesn't change God's word. Last night, for example, in the evening service, I talked about the ministry of Aquila and Priscilla serving together with the Apostle Paul. And the reality was that uh, they even held a church in their home uh, because everything about their lives was given over to advancing the cause of Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ and establishing people in churches. We read last night where that when Paul was in, uh, uh, in Ephesus, he uh, decided to go to Syria, and from there he went to Caesarea, from there he went to Antioch. But before he left Ephesus, he asked Aquila and Priscilla, would you remain here 
and continue work among the church here in Ephesus to free me to be able to go and to to do more in what God has called me to do. And so uh, they were willing to do that. Their dedication was not to the craft that they had of tent making, but their they understood that their vocation really was a higher calling, that they had a calling to serve God by serving the people of God and by communicating the gospel. And so uh, they just pulled up their tent stakes and went where God appointed in their life and they obeyed the direction of God in their life and the counsel of the man of God to them was as of the oracles of God. And so they obeyed. I wonder, are we in our spirit obedient to the principle of, of assembling with the body of Christ religiously, faithfully, loyally, lovingly? You know, I, I, I understand that there are people that maybe they live in areas that there's not a good church in their proximity and and uh, so forth. But you know what? They don't stop looking. They don't stop serving. They don't stop uh, winning people to Jesus Christ. They don't stop taking in preaching uh, from a church that they uh, can draw encouragement from through the word of God. And, and, and the fact is that, look, the church is God's plan for your life, not just my life, for your life. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When I wasn't a pastor, guess what? I was faithful in a church. That gave me the opportunity to be a pastor. And so the fact remains that they were always obedient. And now he says something profound about their personal character. He says, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So they accentuated their obedience to gather, to fellowship, to communicate the gospel, uh, to uh, communicate as we read through this. They, they communicated uh, with the apostle Paul, meaning they gave him money to assist in his missionary endeavors. And, uh, and their obedience was accentuated when the apostle Paul was not there. Much more, he said, in my absence. And so uh, they didn't want to let down and somehow give the indication that their loyalty was to the preacher alone. Now, it's amazing. Uh, Freeway is just like many churches, and that is that you have a big crowd on Sunday morning, uh, you have about half that number on Sunday night, and then you have about half that number again on Wednesday night. And uh, then, you know, God forbid you should call a special prayer meeting because uh, you, you, you'd you have enough people get together, you could probably hold it in the in the men's restroom and uh, still be rattling around like BBs in a box car. And, and, and the fact is that, look, um, what does that prove? You know, you know, I think really honestly, uh, sometimes there are people that come Sunday morning because they love the preacher. And there are people that come Sunday night because they love the church. And people that come Wednesday night because they love the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, the fact is that... Uh, Paul said, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. And so uh, they were accentuating their obedience to the Lord when the apostle was absent from them. Um, sometimes uh, people, when they hear that the pastor is going to be out of town, they feel like that that's their ticket to stay home or to do something else. And that's the Sunday that you need to be extra faithful. Uh, you know, the pastor's on a missions trip or he's on a vacation. And uh, which, by the way, uh, in going on 18 years here at Freeway, I've never one single year taken all my vacation days. And I say that to my shame. And uh, I haven't taken one yet this year, and I'm planning to, I, I hope and pray, because I'm tired. Uh, but, uh, and I, and I, I need a little bit of a rest. But uh, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, um, sometimes a pastor when he's getting ready to go, doesn't want to broadcast to everybody, hey, I'm going to be on a vacation for a week. I'll miss a service or two because uh, there's something inside that uh, is a little trepidatious that people are just going to seize that opportunity as, as uh, an occasion for them not to be found faithful. And, uh, but here we discover that they were, they were obedient and much more in his absence. And he's saying this, 
now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is a place that many people have misunderstood in the scriptures and have misinterpreted to say somehow that we need to work our way uh, into salvation or we work our way to heaven and that nothing could be further from the truth. If you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you know that he was the apostle that championed the grace of God. He was used of the Lord to uh, deliver the, the book that contains a treatise on the gospel of God's grace, the book of Romans. And so he's not deviating from what he has previously written. Really, the converse is true. What he's doing is He's trying to help them understand certain things about the Christian life. And what we discover here is he's saying, look, in my absence, start working out the principles of the saved or the Christian life. Uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling in the presence of the Lord, knowing that one day we'll stand before him and give an account. Let's do the work of a saved person. Let's, let's begin to work out what God has ordained for us in our Christian lives. Now, I liken this often to a marriage because indeed when we get saved, we become the bride of Christ. And I think that you uh, that have been married can relate to this. It's easy to stand up in front of a group of people and say, I do, okay? Um, I, I know you might have passed out when it happened to you. You, you might have uh, you know, locked your knees and fell over somebody in the wedding party. Uh, you might have been afraid walking down the aisle. Your knees were knocking. I, I, and I get that part. You say, that wasn't easy. That was hard for me to get up there in front of those people. But, you know, really, when you put it in the grand scheme of things, to stand up there and to exchange a few vows and to say, I do, that was the easy part. The hard part was to go home and live it out. The hard part was to go home and get along. Now, the first year you're on your honeymoon, everybody thinks, hey, it, you know, life is grand. You know, we're living the Vita Loca. But, you know, long about three years in and you start having kids and money's tight and you put on some weight, and you're kind of letting yourself go and, and the schedule is a little unrelenting and a little aggravated, maybe you don't feel well, maybe you've had some changes in your, in, in your health. You know, there's all kinds of dynamics that can be brought to bear. And then all of a sudden you realize that, you know, this is requiring a great deal more work to work out this marriage uh, than I thought it would. And, uh, you know, when you were tw 21 and said, I do, you know, you just thought, man, we're going to live on love and buy on time and everything's going to be grand. But, you know, you woke up one day and realized that, hey, this, this requires some effort. This takes some work. And, uh, you know, when we get saved, our eternal salvation is secure. But now that we are saved, God calls us to live out the principles of the Christian life, to work that out. And what it means literally is with fear and trembling before Almighty God, uh, we understand we're living our life under his purview because the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Uh, you know, I, I think we often take that verse of scripture to mean that, you know, God is watching and he's going to get you. And that's not what it really means. It means that God wants to help you when you need the help. He wants to empower you he wants to encourage you and he wants to reward you and so man when I recognize that God is looking down at what's happening here right now God is watching it, it it makes me want to deal seriously with the truth not glibly or idly it makes me want to be extra careful to lead the flock of God over the which God has given me oversight uh, as a bishop, an elder, also known as a pastor. And so we realize that uh, we're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And, you know, in every way, I think that this uh, correlates with what we find uh, in Second Peter chapter 1, where it begins to say, add to your faith virtue. 
In other words, now that you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, begin to live out the principles of the Christian life. And then it moves along there in First Peter or Second Peter chapter one, verse 10, where it says to work out your own, or rather to um, do, do all diligence to make your calling and election sure. So you know what? Uh, as I begin to live out the principles of the Christian life, I sense the dynamic of the Holy Spirit at work in my life. I see God's hand in my life. I begin to witness the fingerprints of God in my life. And what it does is it helps me know for a certainty to know that I know that I know that what I have is genuine. It's real. And I see the evidence of it. There are a lot of people that have that prayed a prayer when they were to camp someday, and there's really not been any measurable substantive evidence in their life that anything ever took place. I'm sad to say that I know people, listen, I know some preacher's kids, I'm a preacher's kid, that uh, made a decision one time, but you know what? When they turned 18, they walked out of the house and never went back to church, and, and there's very little evidence in their lives to indicate whatsoever that they ever made a sincere decision. There, there's no ongoing record that uh, makes them sure of their eternal calling. And, and what we find here is that, look, we're not working our way into heaven. That was settled by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we're working out the life of the heaven bound in the presence of God because while the apostle may not be there, and while the pastor may not be there, and in this context, this is what's being communicated. Much more now, do it because God is there. Do you understand? That's more powerful than because the pastor is there taking attendance or because the apostle is there. Do it because God is there and you have a conscience toward God. And then it, it follows naturally for it is God which worketh in you, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. So God is working in a dynamic within his people to lead them to a place of obedience. And there's way more packed into this that I want to share with you tomorrow uh, when we come back to our Bible study time. But I just want you to consider the fact God is calling us to live a life of obedience before him, not just in front of the preacher, not just in front of someone that we feel can hold us spiritually accountable. But now we're going to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that we do so before the Lord. And we're not doing it for men, uh, not with eye service, Colossians 3 says, as men pleasers, uh, but we're serving the Lord from the heart. And so uh, I think that we, we need to consider this. I know that I didn't get very far, but that's okay. We'll come back to it tomorrow. And uh, I hope that you'll join us at 10 o'clock. And uh, I want to ask your prayer this week. Uh, I've got a tremendous uh, uh, workload ahead of me this week in, in terms of, uh, of course, we have a Facebook Live every day, um, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. We have the memorial service Saturday preparation for ser for services on Sunday uh, and uh, then planning for uh, memorial services, doing pastoral work. And then I'll be preaching four times uh, at a missions conference. Uh, I'll be recording four sermons uh, this week, full-length sermons and sending them to the Philippines. And at a point, I'll let you know when that is, we'll all be able to log on to the internet and participate together with several thousand other people that will be viewing uh, a virtual missions conference broadcast from uh, the uh, southern uh, province of the Philippines down in Panay on the uh, provincial capital island of Cebu uh, from the Bible Baptist Church there in Katipunan. And we're looking forward to that. But pray for me that God would give me strength and wisdom and a clarity of thought and mind that I would be able to clearly and succinctly articulate the, the principles that God has impressed upon me to, to stir believers in other regions of the world to do more for world evangelization than they've ever done before. Thanks for joining us today. I love you, and I'm grateful to the Lord for you. Have an awesome day.